again. So our next presenter is Dr. Archie Chapman. Archie is a senior lecturer in uh, in the School of Computer Science, in, sorry, in the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the University of Queensland. So he is going to talk about transitive energy framework from optimal power flow to peer-to-peer -peer trading. So Archie, uh, so I'm stop sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Yeah. Right, well, I'll get into this. Um, thank you, Ways. Uh, and thanks to the other presenters as well who presented before me. Um, thankfully, you've given a fantastic background and overview to the presentation that I'm about to give. I was a little worried that it would be running a bit over time, but now I don't think there'll be such a concern because I'll be able to cut through the, the background and motivation nice and quick. So thank you to, uh, to Thomas and, and the other presenters earlier. Um, so this, this presentation is based on a paper we had published uh, earlier in the year um, on basically the transactive energy framework with peer-to-peer -peer trading being a very large part of that. Um, and what I'll do in this presentation is go through the different ways you can set up transactive energy frameworks and have a look at how they uh, implement solutions that can, can help the system or in particular the distribution network and why this is an important thing to consider whenever you're setting up any sort of transactive energy framework. Um, so just to start with, um, as we know, uh, this, these are some figures for Australia. Um, these are figures looking at the amount of PV and battery storage capacity we're expecting to see installed over the next sort of decade and a half. And the capacity is huge. Um, uh, in Australia, we're already off to a flying start on PV capacity, but battery storage is coming along very quickly as well. The, um, this isn't just an Australian story, though. This is a global story. We can see that the global rate of market decentralisation as driven by measures such as the, amount of, the number of prosumers in a, in a, or uh, small users of energy that are generating their own supply um, is growing around the world. So this, Australia might be at the forefront of this, but it's just a, the, in the vanguard of, of a wave of technological change that's going to sort of crash across all sorts of power systems in the near future. What does this mean? What does this mean? Um, so let's get some, some sort of technical understanding of what the consequences of this will be. Um, this is fairly standard sort of diagram of a, of a power system from transmission down to distribution. Okay, so power engineers, and I'm not a power engineer, but power engineers focus typically on the area in pink historically, and the distribution network was historically considered a passive element of the system. There was protection and things like that, but in terms of dispatch and the economics, it was just operated as, as more of a passive element. And what we're seeing with the rise of prosumers is a need to make this more actively managed. Um, so we'll be focusing here on the, the area in blue, everything below, say, a, a distribution substation. Um, what we're seeing is a change in the direction of flow of power from central generation uh, out to the load points uh, to a switch where we have much more distributed generation of flows across the network and between what we considered originally load entities um, to which are now prosumers that are generating their own energy. So if we have a quick look, I've just got a couple of dialogue boxes up on my screen, which will obscure in my own view. So give me one second. If we have a look at the uh, the way that we expect this to affect a stylized network that I have here. So you can think of this middle circle as a transmission network. And then as we go out to the very small circles, these are the consumers at the, the fringe of the grid. Um, as the number of, or the proportion of uh, PV or proportion of, let's, let's focus on PV, uh, increases at certain nodes on the network, we can see that what we're, just, we're trying to show in this image is that uh, voltage issues in particular or network network issues generally start to arise on the, on the distribution grid in particular. Okay, so as we have more and more of these nodes switching over to being prosumers who are generating their own electricity, we're seeing the deepening red color illustrating 
that we have increasing network issues. And typically there's voltage issues, but there can also be um, constraints on reverse power flows and various other things. Um, and then as we get up to very high penetrations of um, prosumers on some parts of the network, we see network issues arising very, very regularly. And this is borne out by empirical fact in parts of Australia, like South Australia and Queensland, where due to high concentrations of PV installations, we're seeing some parts of the network with voltage issues 50 days out of the year, um, which is a really, really big problem that needs active management. Um, luckily, we have technology coming to save us. So through things like the Internet of Things and smart devices, and also the rollout of software uh, that enables distributed energy marketplaces. And I won't go into that in any detail because the previous presenters have already covered a lot of the background on that. So what I'm going to do now is to go through a few different uh, frameworks or approaches to managing and coordinating distributed energy resources like PV or batteries, or electric vehicles that are embedded in the distribution network and try and give you a sense of how these different um, frameworks can alleviate or ameliorate the issues that they, they cause if they're not coordinated. So ameliorate those network issues, which I've just tried to illustrate. To do this, I'm going to make use of a particular diagram, which you'll see again and again, this diagram here on the right. Um, this diagram sort of tries to stylistically plot the, the transactive energy framework that we're considering uh, on two dimensions. The first is whether it's more or less consumer focused or consumer oriented um, or system oriented. And the second is a, is, a, is a sort of an orthogonal consideration. It is whether or not the method that we're looking at is aware of the network that it's embedded on, or whether it's oblivious to the network. So we're going to look at a few different methods, plot them on this diagram, and then have a look at how they affect the network. And perhaps based on the way we've set up this uh, diagram, the results won't surprise you, but um, I think it's good just to get a, a lay of the land uh, to understand exactly how the different proposed technologies or not specific technologies, but groups of technologies or approaches uh, have different consequences. The technologies we'll be looking at are simple home energy management, where individual homes look after their own energy management problems independently. Home energy management with what we call operating envelopes, which is where a DSO or a distribution system operator might apply some limits on what the home energy management system can do in terms of uh, imports or particularly exports of power, uh, voltage levels of inverters and, and things like that. Peer-to-peer um, -peer energy trading, so a specific market mechanism will be introduced a bit later. Um, the idea of a virtual power plant and then the, in some ways, gold standard, in other ways, a little bit, um, a little bit too ambitious or a little bit too, uh, too much of the Rolls-Royce, the, the OPF, the optimal power flow solution. Okay, so on this diagram here, we have home energy management down in the bottom right corner which is network oblivious. It doesn't even know it's on a network, but it's completely customer oriented. So it's minimizing the customer's costs. Um, but as I said, completely oblivious to the effects of the network. Um, going over to the bottom left corner, we have still home energy management now with operating envelopes, which is has a network focus in that it has, it's aware of the network through the operating envelopes, but it's still focused very much on the customer. Up on the top left, we have OPF, which has the strong network focus, but is typically focused on minimizing costs across the whole system rather than focusing on customers and, and worrying about their prerogatives and their preferences. Uh, and then over in the in the right hand corner, probably the corner you don't want to be in, it's network oblivious and system oriented, uh, where you're not really aware of what customers want and you're also not really aware of what the network wants, so you're aggregating at a higher level. Um, so these are, these are just some ideas of peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems then sort of sit somewhere in the middle. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at exactly what consequences this has for, for outcomes for the network and for customers. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, I've cut all of the technical detail out of this presentation. I think that's a, appropriate for the, 
the audience, but if you want to see the technical detail, um, you can go and have a look at this paper, uh, which is referenced at the bottom here, uh, a recent paper by a group of us who was spread out across a number of different universities now, uh, but we all used to work together at the University of Sydney. Okay, so first of all, home energy management, you're probably familiar with this concept. Um, this would be a fairly typical energy management system within a home where we have some demand. Um, we might have thermal storage or thermal water heating, which is uh, needing uh, some electrical supply. We might have an alternate uh, supply of energy in terms of a fuel cell rather than running purely off grid electricity. There's, there's a fairly generic setup that we have set here, but let's just um, focus really on the main things, which is say a PV system, a battery and a grid supply where we can control the charge rate on the battery in order to minimise costs. Okay, so this is a fairly fairly standard energy management problem that uh, behind the meter that a customer might face. Um, this is the this is some uh, some explanation of the optimization problem that such a home energy management uh, agent or, or piece of software might be solving for a, for a customer behind the meter. And that would be to schedule energy over a decision horizon to minimize the expected cost. Um, here, there's, there's a bit of uh, notation. Really, all we're trying to say is that we're minimizing cost um, subject to prices, um, supply constraints, and some, um, some exogenous information, which is uncertainty in terms of um, load or uh, PV generation. Um, we may have lots of devices within our home that we're trying to schedule, which means we may have a large state space and a large action space. So we, we could solve a problem like this exactly with a really rich model of a battery and an electric vehicle um, with really complicated probability models for our uh, uncertain variables using a method like dynamic programming, but this can get very computationally difficult to solve. So instead, in the in the paper I was just talking about, we can we can implement a useful approximation using linear programming by linearizing all our constraints, and uh, and and doing some tricks with the the probability distributions that we're working with. Um, in terms of making this really good for a home, it might not be the best thing to do for for our analysis purposes. Using linear programming is sufficient. Um, okay. How then do we uh, implement the same style of thing, but now with operating envelopes? Um, the operating envelopes that we're talking about are those uh, constraints that a DSO might wish in the near future to push down to controllable devices behind the meter that limit how much power they can inject or absorb from the grid at any point in time. Um, typically, we'd expect these things to be computed using um, the, say, a linearization around a, an operating point of the power flow equation. So, extracting the Jacobian matrix and then looking at the the, um, the point at which those linearized power flows intersect with constraints and, and setting our our um, our operating envelopes based on those. Um, one catch. At the current state of the art is that we don't have effective state estimation techniques that can do this on distribution networks nice and quick. But let's say we did have these things available, um, we would then be able to implement our operating envelopes and and allow home energy management to go ahead, subject to these additional constraints. Okay, so the third method which we'll look at and we're going to do a comparative analysis of these methods at the end. The third is this idea of a virtual power plant. Um, this is a term which has a lot of a lot of different interpretations depending who you talk to. So we're going to go with a specific definition of a virtual power plant. Um, our virtual power plant is arranged at the um, at the the level of what we call an aggregator, where an aggregator is able to bid directly into a wholesale market, but the aggregator um, aggregates small customers. So Thomas talked about the small customers not being able to directly participate in wholesale markets. Um, and this is a this is a fundamental limitation to, to the way wholesale markets are set up. There's usually bid increments and all sorts of things that just make it infeasible for the many, many millions of small customers directly 
participate in these things. So we use aggregators instead, where an aggregator might um, aggregate the energy use of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users. Um, in fact, that's what retailers do now, but we can think of aggregators being a, a sort of a retailer 2.0. Um, and the, um, so the, the framework there is where we have, uh, so the market framework there is where we have, currently we have a deregulated market in, in a country like Australia and a lot of parts of the world, uh, North America and Europe and other parts of the world. Um, the, the framework there has the independent system operator, which might be the transmission system operator and a market operator. They might be the same thing. Um, let's call it the, the ISO. Um, interacting directly with generators and passing energy and financial flows to the DSO. Um, so charging them for the energy supplied to the, the distribution um, system operator within the distribution system operator passing energy onto the consumers. But in Australia, we have the, the retailers collecting money from the consumers and then passing it back to the DSOs, TSOs and generators as they need to. Um, and that's all administered by the Australian energy market operator. So that's a vertically disintegrated um, or deregulated market. Um, if we add in prosumers, we have a bit of a problem though, because the prosumers are trying to react to um, prices which are set at the ISO level. And this, this leads to a breakdown in the way that the flows are set up, the financial flows in particular are set up under the current market structure. So instead, uh, Australia is sort of investigating and slowly unbundling various support services from the wholesale market and allowing third party aggregators to enter the market for, say, for example, for frequency control and ancillary services um, and in the near future for demand response services. So I'll call them megawatts, even though I don't like that term, but just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so the aggregators now have, will have a relationship with both distribution service operators, probably the ISO, but also with the retailer and the prosumers. Okay, so things things get complicated, um, but this this allows for greater flexibility in the, in the services that can be um, provided by prosumers because we would expect innovation at the aggregator level, which would lead to to greater. Um, greater amounts of specialised services being provided by the aggregators. Our overall cost should be lower. Um, however, we need to have some sort of level of coordination between the DSO, the retailer and the aggregators in order to make sure that network constraints aren't violated. Okay. Um, so we're going to assume that a distribution system operator is responsible for this. Um, in that case, we have the um, the aggregator facing a cost minimization problem subject to constraints that are handed to them by the DSO. Okay, so these look a lot like the operating envelopes that we saw in the home energy management problem, but instead now they're being handed to the aggregator rather than to the end user agent. And it's up to the aggregator to abide those constraints and send control actions to their subscribing user agents based on, on, um, on what they get from the DSO. Okay. Um, it's cognizant of time, I'll keep running through this. Um, so the current state of the art has the VPPs somewhat oblivious to the networks that they're operating on and having to also compete in some ways against the users that they're, that they're, um, they're aggregating. Uh, in that the users might be more interested in satisfying their own loads and preferences while the VPP is trying to hit some sort of market targets. They might be, you know, bid targets that they've set that they've been into the market themselves. And this can lead to suboptimal outcomes, uh, just broadly speaking. So a greater degree of coordination and alignment between the, the, um, the VPP and the customers is required. And I, I think that's without wind put words into um, anyone's mouth, I think that's what the previous two sets of presentations we're talking about, trying to align those, the preferences between customers and, and aggregators or DSO in a better way using contracts and various other things. So this isn't a novel idea. This is what everyone's trying to get to using economics. Um, 
Okay, I'll just, I thought I'd cut those couple of bullet points out, but clearly I had it at the end there. Um, the next step in VPP, so going beyond the current deployed state of the art, will be to, um, to explicitly include um, customer preferences in some way into their decision making. Um, and I'll skip through this a little bit quickly because I really want to get to peer-to-peer -peer elements. Um, and the, um, the, the last way of doing this would be to allow customers to retain their, fully, um, their full prerogative while exploiting the flexibility they have. In order to get to this point, we need to make use of some more advanced um, economic type reasoning or strategic reasoning. So um, there are techniques from game theory and market design which can allow for this, but we simply don't have space to go and time to go into those in any great detail at the moment. Um, but there are, there are ways that this can be done. They are not implemented in practice. I don't think they've actually been tried in any of the trials that have been going on around the world yet either. But uh, I'm sure we're all greedily eyeing that sort of a space in terms of a, an opportunity to demonstrate what we can really do um, to make sure that things like VPPs and aggregators can perform effectively in wholesale markets while satisfying customers' preferences. Um, okay, so the second last uh, the second last method I'd like to cover quickly is distributed optimal power flow. Um, this is probably quite familiar to a lot of you in that it's a standard model that you, you learn um, maybe at grad school, maybe not in undergraduate. But we have things like um, a cost function, we have our technical constraints defined by the, the physics of the network, and we have, uh, uh, sorry, we have technical constraints and the physics of the network giving us constraints in our power flow. And we can, using some uh, fairly useful mathematics, um, using decompositions and, and dual reformulations of the problem, we can effectively solve this and solve it in a distributed way as well. Um, so again, if, if there were any questions later on, I have a whole bunch of other slides where we can go into this in great detail, but these are, this is a fairly standard way of, of modeling the, the dispatch problem at the transmission level. Uh, but it's not really applied to distribution networks because the number of variables and the sheer size of the networks, as well as the fact that non-linearity is bite a lot harder at the distribution level, makes it, um, makes it hard, as in computationally hard, to solve these things, uh, let alone to model them, given that distribution networks topologies are changing constantly. So making sure you've got the correct model to start with is, is a challenge in itself. Okay. So um, we can have a think about how going through those, those virtual power plant uh, frameworks move through this diagram. If we start off at the top right corner, which is where I said we started off, we didn't really want to be there. Um, we can see that VPPs would be evolving over time to move to a more customer focus and then uh, taking into account things like OPF, we might be able to get to, a, say, a VPP 3.0 where we have the customer focus and all the network constraints that are captured in OPF all considered in one go. But this is going to be a computationally very difficult thing to, to deal with. And it might not even be the right thing to do given um, things like uncertainties and just the lack of sophistication in the customer end. Do we really want to be there? Perhaps something simpler, computationally, conceptually simpler, like a peer-to-peer -peer trading mechanism will get us most of those benefits and and uh, and allow us to unlock a lot of the flexibility and value that sits behind the meter in, in power networks. Okay, so that's the, the big picture. Perhaps there's something that's that's not maybe not quite as good, but an awful lot easier to implement, uh, a lot easier to understand that gets us most of the way there. All right. Um, that slide also should have been dropped out, but just as a, a flag to some previous work that we did um, was the, the Bruni Island battery trial where we actually implemented multi-period optimal power flow in order to coordinate customer owned batteries um, on Bruni Island in Tasmania to overcome a capacity constrained undersea cable. The, um, the distributed OPF method worked quite effectively to, 
to reduce the amount of diesel that was used and even stop diesel startups. Um, so Bruny Island has particularly spiky uh, load profile given that it's a, a holiday destination. So being able to use customer owned batteries to reduce diesel use on that island um, was very effective because we didn't have to draw on them very often during the year. Most of the time, the batteries were used to serve the customer's purposes. Um, and that used the OPF framework. But it was very, it was, it, we could only scale this up to, well, we got this to scale up to about 32 customers. Scaling it to 320 wouldn't have been possible with the technology we had, let alone thousands. Okay, so that's, um, it was a success for what I wanted to do, but in terms of demonstrating scale, I don't think it was quite there. So it's a bit of a red flag. Um, so instead, let's have a think about peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. So I'm probably telling you all things you know. Um, this is peer-to-peer -peer versus a pool market, direct, uh, illustrated on a very simple diagram. So peer-to-peer -peer has customers trading directly with each other by establishing bilateral contracts. Whereas the pool market, the customers trade with some pool, um, which is administered by a, a central authority. Um, what we're looking at in terms of peer-to-peer -peer energy markets would be local energy markets that live on uh, the low voltage um, components of the network. And you have a lot of these things for, for certain, you'd set them up in certain networks where low voltage networks, where there is a, a surplus of prosumers that can allow sort of a, a thickness of the market that allows a certain degree of trade. Um, a particular way you could set up the market would be to use a continuous double auction. Um, these are the sorts of auctions that were used that are used all the time in in stock markets um, and other other sort of settings where there's a need to trade continually. The it requires an auctioneer, which can be fairly simply automated. If you know stock markets, you know that the trades that occur on stock markets happen very, very quickly um, and, continue, and pretty much continuously. And they're not run by a person. They're, they're run by a piece of software and everyone knows how the piece of software works. Um, the basic process is that buyers submit bids to purchase certain quantities of, of energy at up to a certain price, whereas sellers submit um, bid offers to sell a certain quantity at a at a minimum price or above. And the the catch is that um, is that the you have to define the, the way that the 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 bidders in these markets might strategically price or bid their their bids. But the um, the nice thing is the structure of the CDA allows for fairly simple bidding heuristics to perform really quite effectively and get quite close to um, an efficient outcome within the market. So we can approximate the market by using what we call zero intelligence traders, um, which just don't bid things that are going to cause a loss, only bid things that are going to cause a, an expected gain. Um, okay, that's the, the limit prices that I'm talking about there on the slide. Okay. Um, so the way the continuous double auction works is there's an order book, uh, which keeps a, a list of the bids and asks which are present in the market at the time. And if ever those two bids and asks cross over, then there's a trade and the price is set at whatever the price the trade was. Um, the spread of the market is the gap between the, the current maximum bid and the current ma uh, minimum ask. Um, and if there's no spread, then, then that's when you're see, seeing trades happening. Okay, so these things can be implemented. It's really, really simple. And these things can be implemented very quickly and efficiently. Um, one thing that we tried out was, okay, let's, um, let's allow a CDA to operate, but only allow trades if they don't actually violate any of the network constraints that we're seeing in the market, uh, that we're seeing in the network. So if we can approximate the, 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 uh, the network constraints using a linearized model, like I talked about earlier with the operating envelopes, then we can put over the top of a CDA, a continuous double auction, the, uh, what we called a permission structure, which only allows trades to occur if they're not going to, they're not expected to violate the network constraints. Okay, so then, then we have the, the matching process that's coordinated through the CDA, but we have the network constraints 
um, captured in this permission structure. And that gives us the best of both worlds. So the, the linearized model is quick and easy to implement. The CDA is quick and easy to implement. All the complexity is left out on the agents. So you can have a really sophisticated bidding strategy if you want to. You can use a zero intelligence trader if you want to. Um, what I'm going to do is go over a quick comparative analysis of these different methods on a network that looks suspiciously similar to the one that Thomas was working with. I think we all work with some pretty similar models that are based on the um, open DSS data, which is available. Um, so uh, where are we? Let's say we have uh, some consumers, which are just consumers. We have another group of prosumers who have PV systems. And we have a third, um, a third group, which have in green that have both PV and a, uh, a similarly sized or a suitably sized battery. And we're looking at this network here where we have um, mainly these prosumers with PV and batteries, but we also have some with uh, just PV and some that are just consumers. Um, we used some Australian solar home and electricity data to populate this network. We adjusted some of the parameters in the network to make it more look, look more like an Australian network rather than a UK network. 